morning. I am your host, Jason Miles, and welcome to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. If you're new to the channel, please hit like, hit subscribe. Don't forget to hit the notification bell as we're adding new shows and cross streams constantly. Just yesterday, we did kind of an impromptu Monday show with a uh, good friend of show, friend in real life, Coach William Liu basketball one of the basketball coaches at oakland high and uh another friend of show uh wasney lombre sadly i was not able to do all of the haitian hello stuff that pascal does whenever there's a haitian guest on but wasney definitely felt welcome we had a great discussion uh first of course about the nba world champion golden state warriors of course, we had to discuss that. Kind of the changing of the game in this in this new era. And then we got into what the real discussion was, what I wanted to be about, which was the gentrification of, uh, of youth athletics and what is the potential future if we keep going down this route of, uh, of what capitalism will do to youth athletics. Um, it kind of ended on a bit of a somber <laughs> note but fun nonetheless. Also, please do not forget that June 26th, this Sunday, we're going to be live and in person in Brooklyn at Project Parlor. It's an event in conjunction with Sublation Media. Ben Burgess will be there. Norm Finkelstein will be there. Margaret Kimberly of Black Agenda Report will be there. And I just found out Sean uh, KB from the Antifada program, which we've done some cross streams with. Um, will be there on a panel as well. It's free, people, so there's no excuse for you not to show up. We can meet and build. And if you guys are unaware, my co-host, Pascal Robert, was on uh, Brianna Joy Gray's show recently. Uh, I believe he just did an episode of Crystal Ball's show as well. Um, I was recently on The Majority Report with Sam Cedar as well as Diet Soap with Doug Lane. So please be sure to check all that fun stuff out. So let's bring in my homie, my co-host, my dog. He is the Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles. I want to say thank you, everyone, for following my appearance on a Bad Faith Podcast with Brianna Joy Gray. That was last week. I will be appearing on the 30th, I believe it's scheduled, with Crystal Ball on her podcast with Kyle Kalinske. Uh, I don't know if it's actually video or just audio, but I was I was connected with them, and they're interested in having me on. Please also go check out my man Jason Miles on the Majority Report talking all about his second I don't know, say actually, this is third, I believe, video essay. Maybe even fourth. No, it's way more. We have like seven or eight. Okay, there's I a lot. Counted. Well, this was the one that really stuck out in my mind. Same as as same as it ever was talking about black popular culture in the post civil rights era. Please come check us out this weekend in Brooklyn, Brooklyn. Oh, also, I don't know why we keep forgetting to say this. Uh, every Monday. Uh, Pascal and I do David Feldman's show, and this past Monday he wanted to break it up a little bit, so that was actually a very interesting conversation uh, <laughs> that we had that kind of is going to dovetail a little bit into what we're talking about, definitely with the 13th Amendment, and <laughs> somehow he wanted to talk about January 6th, and it was a, a Pascal even said, Jason gets a very visceral reaction when you bring these things up. <laughs> I, I know my, my host, Jason, well, and I was correct in saying that. But, yeah, that was an interesting hodgepodge of, of subject matter that we talked about on uh, David Feldman. Check out yesterday's David Feldman if you can as well. That was a really great conversation we had about a variety of things, some of them touching what we're talking about today. But um, besides that, how are you, Brother Jason Miles? Uh, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling all right. We got the show going. Uh, we have our favorite moderator slash Faceless voice in Tucson. Hello, everyone. How are you? 
I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right because I just found out some very good news, which is that someone in the chat posted, a few people posted, we are now at 10K subs. Yes, I was aware of that for a couple of days now. That's correct. My daughter sent me a message. I told her she should watch the show today. Um, and she sent me a message and she said, oh, I saw you hit 10,000 on Father's Day. And I was this close oh. to responding. That doesn't give you an excuse why you didn't call him. Ooh. This is a call out. So you take that. You may be my favorite. You don't do that when your dad has a show. Right? You may be my favorite yeah. oldest daughter. But uh I was hurt, man. She's I was my favorite at... oldest daughter of yours, too. She's a pretty badass oldest daughter, but I definitely was watching the phone. Um like like a uh, like a girl waiting for the prom call, and I didn't get it. And so, uh, someone said the daughters are canceled. Yes, <laughs> all of them. all 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 daughters canceled, from the legitimate to the illegitimate. Daughters canceled. Nice. And if you know me personally, you know how funny the joke actually is. Word. <laughs> someone says, Jason, remember when her birthday comes up? That's fine. I'm poor. So anything she gets, she's like, oh, thanks for the card. Thanks for the can of beans, Dad. <laughs> I know. Thanks for the thanks for supersizing my McDonald's, Dad. <laughs> well, let's bring in our guest, the man of the evening. Uh, I hit up. Well, first of all, Bertram's been on the show before a few times, and we were first uh uh, made aware of Bertram when he wrote a great piece that uh, that I kind of referred to actually for the last video essay. Um, who gets to uh, speak for Black people in the in the culture industry? And uh, he wrote it in Current Affairs. Uh, it was shared around our group of friends uh, quite a bit. So we got to have Bertrand on um, with Tere, and then he came back. We did the Bill Cosby video essay. He got to come back for that one, which was actually a really good one. Um, but uh, I don't know if he sent it to me, but I had already seen it. This cat got into it, Pascal, with Sandy Darity on Twitter. Bertrand? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's why we're doing this show. This fool was getting into a Sandy Darity, and he was he was calling him out on Twitter, and uh, and Darity responded. What was Darity talking? Oh, 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 let's just me. let's just bring this gentleman in. It's everyone's favorite light skinned dude from Southern California, Bertram Cooper. All right, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I need that on a business card. Everyone's favorite light skinned dude. All right, from SoCal, um, you got to make sure. Jason Pascal, how are you? What's going on, bro? I did not know that today's subject matter was sparked. By a little Twitter conflagration you had with a uh, Dr. Uh, William Sandy Darity. It was, yeah, and it was unexpected too because it seemed like it was a series of shoulder tapping happening on two different sides. Where a friend of mine uh, mentioned my work in USA Today, he got a column there, John Wood Jr. Somebody uh, didn't like his <laughs> reading of the stats. So John calls me in, and as I am uh, basically standing up for that interpretation, Darty's name comes up. And I'm not expecting Darty to actually show up or anything like that. I wasn't even trying to call him out. We were just referencing his work. But then Sandy showed up, and uh, I got to you know, ask him a question, more or less, that I wanted to ask him for a long um, time, which is, I I'm assuming you know everybody knows the uh, racial wealth gap. And, pretty much how that formula is delivered to folks, but you split up white and black folks into income quintiles that gives you five groups. And if you take any one of these groups, you compare white people and black people aren't earning the same income, the medium wealth favors white folks, where they often have two to three times the difference in people in their same class. But the big picture is that the overall white median wealth is normally around 10 times uh, or more what it is for the black wealth. What I wanted to ask him though was, and I don't, I like to use the famous graphs. I don't want to come up with my own graphs because then people will accuse me of fucking up the numbers. So <laughs> I like to use other people's graphs. So using the same graph that Sandy uses, 
to illustrate the interracial gap, you can see all of these black gaps. And I asked him, why does he never offer a sim uh, similar formula? Where about he the said, internal racial wealth gap within black people, about the fact that the top, the top, that 75% of black wealth is controlled by something like the top, top tier of black elites, like the top 10% of, uh, of black families, and why he never talks about that. And why he never puts it in really, really simple terms. What actually happened, or what had happened in the tweets was that he said that he's never denied that interracial, or I'm sorry, intraracial. He's never denied that black class disparity exists. But there's a real difference between not denying something and offering the stats in a way that folks can digest and ask him why he never does this simple multiplication, but on the black side, and he said it would be misleading, to quote him, it would be misleading to do the black on black comparison when the overall racial uh, wealth is so low. Um, and that, <laughs> having been poor, this stuck a real core with me because just, you know, to run through it real quickly, the big number for me is that black folks in the top 20%, so this is gonna be your incomes over $100,000 in today's number, uh, they have, compared to the bottom 20% of black folks, 1,380 times the median wealth. It's a huge gap. Compared to white folks, it's a, the gap on the black side is 66 times larger. But the gap on the white side, something that you alluded to in your piece on uh, the racial wealth gap, this gap, that gap is considered serious enough to be part of what powered Occupy Wall Street, what powered some of the class sentiment behind Bernie Sanders, what in its own distorted way, uh, powered, you know, some of the, the class sentiments behind Trump. It undergirds the whole conversation. On the black side, a gap between the top and bottom that is 66 times larger than the white side, apparently even mentioning that is misleading. Let, let, let me tell you something. Let me tell you what, this is a great, Bertrand, you have not disappointed me. You came out out the gate with, with the shooting sparks do you know why this is important? Because it proves something that is very, very, very prescient. That viewing Black people as a collective community is only useful when you can leverage it against whites for grievance. But it's not useful mm -hmm. when you're comparing how Black people are using their wealth and being compared with other Black people within their group. In other words, we'll talk about each other as a community as long as we're comparing to how white people are quote unquote doing compared to us or doing quote unquote to us, if you will. But when we'll talk, we don't want to concentrate on the community when the community so-called wealth is disproportionately over 75% in the hands in the top 10% of black families. Uh, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> uh, yeah. The this statistic, you know, people who've been paying attention for, I'll say, the last decade or so, there is a suite of statistics that have all been used to basically promote this idea that all Black folks are having the same experience. And since they're all having the same experience, you can have these sort of race brokers who can do race relations. You can pick one Negro leader who will be, you know, attuned to the needs of all the other Black people because, in essence, we're all going through the same ordeal. There's been a few things that have been used to express that, but this emphasis on the uh, median wealth, a race-wide measure, um, that's been just one of the ones, the go-to ones for suggesting that all black folks are in a similar economic experience. And it's a really weird form of dissonance for me because we love to say that not all black folks are poor. We love to chastise people who make that mistake. You know, the only reason to point this out is if there's meaningful class differences between black people, otherwise they might as well all be poor. And you know, going back to Doherty's work, he's got a report in 2015 called Umbrellas Don't Make It Rain. At that time, the median wealth for the entire race of black people was $7,113. Um, but as a range gets wider, knowing the middle of that range tells you less and less about people on either side of it. So if we, you know, at that time, went to the bottom, you know, the bottom 20% of black folks, um, they had 1.5% of the race wide wealth, the race wide median was 7000 and some change, the median for the black bottom 
was a hundred bucks. If you went up to the next quintile, uh, these are folks that are bottom of working class. Some people call them the lower middle. They're teetering on the edge of poverty, depending on family side or uh, family size. They are in federal poverty. They were at half of the race wide median. So the first two uh, groups of black folks are at a fraction of what this race wide median is conveying. And the bottom black folks, they have one centieth of the race wide median. Then you get to the third quintile and our dollars, this would be, you know, folks making between 45 to $65,000 a year. This is really normally considered like the middle. They have doubled the race wide median. They're at about $14,000 in wealth, 140 times what we're seeing is the median for the bottom 20% of black folks. You go to Q4, we're in upper, mid, mid, uh, upper middle territory. This is folks between 74, $94,000. Um, you know, this is where we're going to get most of the uh, college black folks that I reference so often. And they have six times the black median. You know, they're at around forty two thousand dollars in wealth, 420 times more than the bottom black 20 percent. And then finally you get to Q5, the top 20 percent of black Americans, folks in our dollars who are earning over one hundred thousand dollars a year. And they have 20 times the race wide median. They're working with about one hundred forty thousand dollars in wealth. And they're at 1,380 times the wealth of the bottom 20%. Uh, this is all in Darity's graphs. This information has been updated, I want to say two or three years ago, but you were still in the 1,300 times greater range. And considering how income, wealth dictates my ability to you know, maneuver through any of these initiatives that say Harvard wants more black students or HBO wants more black writers, my income and my wealth dictate my ability to really take advantage of any of these things. So to not mention these differences and to not take note of the fact that like lay people are interpreting the race wide median as something you can use to get a sense of what most black folks economic life is like. I don't understand how this isn't a part of the conversation. I don't understand how it's not. Well, relevant. Doesn't Darity and the people that love having this racial wealth gap discourse love to add the fact that when you take that percentage that you're mentioning, the, the, the top end of, of black wealth, it still pales in comparison to the top end of white wealth. And that becomes their justification to say, well, even though these black people may be more well off than the lower end, they still aren't as well off as the, the top end white. Well, yeah, they do love to say that. And it's something you only get away with when you're talking about black folks and specifically when you're doing a race wide comparison, because I'll, I'll, you know, Let's switch it to if I were to point out, say that uh, Hispanic women are earning less on the dollar than Hispanic men, your response to me could not be, yeah, but Hispanic men are making less than white folks. So we're all in this together. <laughs> that would be ridiculous. No one would accept that at this point in time. But for some reason, in this black white discussion, you can get away with that. Well, the, the reason why you can get away with that in this black white discussion is because all discussions about race in the United States for over a century, as Jason knows, as we've talked about this several times, particularly with sociologist Zine Magubane, are shaped and framed around the concept of race relations, meaning that black people are not individuals in America. They are a, co they are a coherent group of individuals in one body that must be related to <laughs> white people and everything about them must be as a one whole group be related to white people. So it's not about how individual black people function in American society. It's about how they relate to whites collectively so that selective individuals like Sandy Darity, like other people that he's worked with, can be chosen as the racial ventriloquist of the hour or the moment or the day or the minute to broker out what is acceptable policy. And I'm sure you probably come to the conclusion by now, Bertrand, that it's not an accident that this racial reductionist, myopic fetishization of the racial wealth, the wealth gap, by the way, I haven't found anyone who's shocked or remotely surprised that black people have less wealth than white people. I don't know how that statistic is surprising when up until the 1960s, over 60% of black labor were domestic workers or sharecroppers working in plantations, picking cotton. How it's shocking to people that today there's a significant racial wealth gap is beyond me. But what is particularly noxious is that this discourse comes about at a time where, with the rise of Occupy, as you mentioned, with the rise of Bernie Sanders, you have even white people who were for so long deluded to believe capitalism was a silver bullet to their problems, 
for the first time challenging, challenging capitalism and demanding class-wide remedies. And if we think it's an accident that the ruling class and people like the Brookings Institute are pushing racial wealth gap, racial grievance discourse at a time when at a time when we realize that having black people revert back to their socialist inclinations would be de destabilizing for the ruling class. If we think that's an accident, I got a bridge in Brooklyn to sell you. Well, I found this quote. Let me find this. Quote. I'm going to read you guys this. While he finds that, I just want to say I would love to get race ventriloquy in uh, or ventriloquism in circulation. I loved when you said it, Pascal. I've seen Adolph Reed uh, Jr. say it. I'm a fan of that uh, that phrase. It really sums it up. I want to know what you guys feel about this quote. This quote was posted a few days ago in a Facebook group that I believe we started. Um, <laughs> Negro is the touchstone of the modern democratic idea. Yeah. The presence of democracy to the proof and reveals the falsity of it. Take the Declaration of Independence, for instance. That seemed a splendid truth. But the black man merely touched it and it became a splendid lie. And in this matter, or the suffrage in the southern states, it is expedient to keep the Negro a serf politically because he is still largely an economic serf. If he should attain political freedom, he would free himself industrial exploitation and contempt. Of course, such a revolution is startling even to think of. That quote is from Hubert Harrison in 1911. Is that quote still relevant today? I don't think that it's the same situation it is today because one of the problems I have with the way in which we elevate the quote from individual from the past, whether it's James Baldwin or Hubert Harrison, is that these guys were living under an apartheid Jim Crow regime in American society. We have now we have now been into a position where we literally have over 10,000 to 15,000 black elected officials who are governing over the condition of black people in municipalities throughout the country. We've had a black political class for over 50 years who are firmly integrated into their role as being emissaries of the ruling class. And to believe that the same way in which black blackness is rendered to redundancy in the early 20th century is the same as today is erroneous. Is it rendered to redundancy? Yes, but it's a it's much more of a class issue than exclusively a racial issue. But because we, as we know, we talked about on the show, we use racial democracy as the vector for which we would increase the participation of black people in, in capitalism during the civil rights movement instead of social, social democracy, which basically means we went with race first remedies, affirmative action, minority set aside and things of that nature, instead of class-based remedies, as Preston Smith talks about in his book, what ends up happening is that it always gives benefit to elite blacks. The same reason why the civil rights movement increases and improves the condition for blacks who are proximate to the middle class or blacks who are proximate to the upper middle class is the same reason why programs like reparations, why minority set-aside contracts, why buy first black, black capitalism are going to help that same class of people. And it's the same reason why reparations ends up being a wealth transfer to the black political class and their class acolytes. So... <laughs> you know, I, I tend to agree with the fact that you, when we go back to the past and we're living, you know, uh, Pascal referenced it earlier, there's, there's a period of time in the past when, you know, prior to 1955, I think that's as far back as the, you know, more recent census poverty report goes from that year prior, more than half of black folks were living in poverty mm -hmm. and you had basically, if you picked out of any two black people at random, you were going to get one who was in poverty. And you still kind of have this, you know, Pascal says it great. You have this whole political process built out of having race relations where one person gets to speak for all the black folks. And at different times, we see people doing things to keep this as, you know, the dominant system. One way is to go through, you know, race wide meetings and make sure it seems like all black folks are basically in the same class. I mean, here's the thing. It, it's it's pretty clear 
what it would take to have democracy, you would need participation of the greatest number of black folks. Right now we have a system that basically says, okay, black folks at the bottom are disenfranchised. You know, what's a great solution. Let's ask Ibram X. Kennedy what he thinks. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, let me, okay, go ahead. Okay. And I, I don't pick on him like harmlessly. I'm a, you know, he's received money from Jack Dorsey over Twitter. He's received, I want to say it was something in the ballpark of $15 million to continue doing his research. He gets to speak as the black, you know, basically black consciousness on a lot of these points. You could do any number of things to increase, uh, you know, how do I put it, the democratic participation of black folks at the bottom and elsewhere. There really isn't much drive to do it. Everything seems to be about brokering with different thought leaders in the black community. When is the last time either of you have anyone say we need to have a working class black black politics, or we need to have a black a black politics rooted in working class issues? Well, that's no, that kind of defeats black excellence, right? Because black excellence isn't working class. Black excellence is kind of bourgeois. It's a bourgeois project. So it's a completely a bourgeois project. But but I wanted to add this this to the whole discussion because this is what I'm starting to see in this era of a lot of. Um, uh hopeful socialist defeats politically there seems to be um almost a strategic win by by uh the democratic party in placing um black females uh in positions of power um and even taking the intersectional route like black queer females black queer um um ethnic diaspora <laughs> females in ends of power to silence these voices that are actually to the left when it comes to public goods governance and i've been saying it over and over you definitely saw it with um with with originally i think pascal wrote about this um hillary clinton talking about you know ending student debt what, what was her comment about uh ending student debt won't stop racism um, well, pri oh, nationalizing the banks won't end racism. Yeah, nationalizing the banks won't end racism. And then you see it again with um, BLM, bum rush and Bernie Sanders uh, during his, his first run. And then the discourse around reparations. And I know we're a little bit older than you, Bertram, but I think you're old enough to have voted in the uh, one of the Barack Obama elections. Yeah. And I never remember hearing any sort of discourse around reparations <laughs> to the point where it was like killing a campaign. Um, so we're starting to see uh, anti-racism or race relations or intersectionality become the tool that really neutralizes, I think, um, public goods policies. Do you guys agree I with think, that? Jason, you are listen you're beyond right on the money bro you're beyond right on the money it's yo know, man listen let's make this abundantly clear the american ruling class after the obama presidency sees the rise of bernie of bernie sanders the, the 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 owners of the means of production are seeing kids who are coming out of elite colleges who normally would be expected to go to finance capital for employment, talking about they proudly claim themselves to be socialists. After eight years of socially engineering black people to believe in a Wall Street Manchurian candidate as the embodiment of what black politics should be, if it became popular within the consciousness of that same black body politic to accept socialism, as a political option, do we really think that the American political establishment will be willing to allow that to be integrated into the minds of black folk as a real political option to the two party system? It would be beyond a threat. Think about how much of a threat Sanders was already with the, with the, with the support he had at the time. And I'm not trying to say to romanticize him. Yo, know, I mean, you know, they, the the American media establishment, every element of the American politics was was focused on neutralizing his effectiveness as much as possible. So I don't think there's no question 
that making that politics as undesirable as possible in black spaces was a significant part of the equation. I find that, you know, everything that seems to happen in the mainstream of black political discourse, these different actors, the race brokers, people who are, you know, leading, I'll say the dominant stream of the uh, woke or anti-racist streams of thought, they operate within the current power structure. They operate within it. They have, to you know, Pascal's point, they could take themselves out. They could all, you know, well, I'm not sure they would be successful, but <laughs> they have the option to use their political leverage to try and bring in more black voices. They typically do not do that. They operate within the white power structure. I mean, to even function, they have to decide that there's some group of white elites that they can curry favor with and that they can, you know, use their favor with those folks to, I don't know, in their minds, maybe get certain, uh, improve access to say Harvard or other spaces that are desirable. I mean, a lot of times this just feels like trying to gain more cultural turf, uh, for the black, like middle and upper middle class, but within the same system that we currently have, you know, uh, when you look at, if you were to ask a lot of people, it feels like there's all this progress that has been made in terms of different cultural spaces for black folks, mostly because, you know, the drum I'm always banging middle class or, um, you know, the appearance of more middle class black folks in popular culture and movies and film and all that. If you were to think about it over the last 10 years, it feels like there's been a lot of interest from white folks in trying to spend their empathy uh, on these different black causes. If you're mostly concerned with the black bottom though, you can look up the US Census report and in 2020, 9 million black folks were living below the poverty line. In 2000, it was 8 million. In 1988, the year I was born, it was 9.3 million. And at the same time that this, basically the black population in poverty has been flat, for the last few years, Harvard has had perfect representation among black students. None of the incoming ones have been from poverty. Uh, there's more black folks on every area of popular culture. They all come through college, uh, which is still very, very classes. So you just, where has all this empathy, all this political leverage been spent? It seems to be getting spent on improving um, access to the power structures that already exist for people who are black middle and upper class. It just increasingly improves their ability to do what well-off white folks have done. And at the same time, it allows like white Democrats to, even though they go to Harvard, they go to Yale, they go to all the same places as their white Republican peers, they get to side with those groups that you listed, uh, Jason, a second ago and say like, yeah, but we're a lot cooler than those other fuckers over there because we're with, you know, these black women who are running set and said show. Um, there's no there's no change for the black poor yeah, i want to stay kind of in the in the cultural in the cultural uh arena with this super chat thank you very much razor leaf uh, for the super chat i really appreciate it and i do before i even read the super chat i want to let people know uh sorry i forgot this on the beginning of the show thursday our thursday show before we really get rocking and rolling on it we're going to do our first fundraiser uh a friend of mine reached out to me that uh her cousin's classroom needed help raising money so they can have just basic materials for the classroom so we're going to try to do a little bit of a uh, a fundraiser for perry's elementary school in my hometown of richmond california but uh, that being said let's read this super chat so it is no accident that we see the media dramatize black wall street watchmen etc as a historic trauma what a spectacle. Um, I think if you look at it, it's a little it's I, the problem. And I don't want to say it's like a it's a conspiracy and, and, and you get the tinfoil hat on. It's easier to make certain projects. Right. Robert Townsend definitely made a movie about a Philip Randolph and unionizing the sleeping car porters. But it was a made for HBO movie and it didn't do very well. And socialism is kept at, at a little bit of a minimum. And it was also made in 
before Obama's president. I think it was made in 05. This was made during the Bush years, which is even more kind of interesting that he was able to make that. But when you look at someone like Ava DuVernay, um, she's she's not making anything that's very jarring to the power structure, right? Even with 13th, that's not very jarring to the power structure because it's got people kind of looking in the wrong direction. Um, and I can't blame all that on her. A lot of that move, uh, movie was based off uh, Michelle Alexander's book. Um, but the last thing that she did that I saw was When They See Us, which is based on the 1989 Central Park Five case, yeah. which is very sad and definitely tugs at the heartstrings and it's moving. And, and you know, Ava can put a good picture together. But between that, Selma, you know, it's just racial grievance because there's something about that where I hate to say it, and we've talked to, to Professor Kelly Dietz about this. There is a kind of a sick obsession with black suffering. You know, there is a lot of times I get bogged down in these discussions about whether or not I'm being a race reductionist or whatnot, or if I'm not giving enough room for race in certain class conversations. Um, what doesn't come up a lot of times, you know, and this is great coming off of Michelle Alexander's book, is that there's a priority in terms of certain traumas. One of them is incarceration. Another is, you know, being on the wrong side of police violence. Um, those are the traumas that really are the best at engaging public sympathies because they are just so horrifying. As it so happens, you take something like incarceration and you go to the Prison Policy uh, Institute and you find out that around, you know, eight out of every 10 prisoners was in poverty prior to going to prison. And because I'm interested in these key issues of say incarceration, in police violence, in concentrated poverty, in unemployment, the reason I don't give that much space to just like a race lens is because we're, you know, you take incarceration, 80% of the prisoners are being harvested from one class of black folks. Um, it's kind of hard to reduce the role of class in that, but we have to fight over who has access to these traumas because they legitimize whether or not you get to speak for black folks. There's a yes. whole list of things that, you know, black people in the middle and upper classes are experiencing in work environments that the black poor never get to enter. And I'm not trying to, you know, <laughs> engage in like, which is worse, whatever, but I do think it's not, you know, uncontroversial to say that microaggressions don't really hold up in the public mind against wrongful uh, <laughs> shootings at the hands of police. And because we have to fight tooth and nail over who has access to that trauma to gain authenticity, to be head Negro who has the most real black experience so that you can talk to all the white people, well, then you have to minimize class and you have to make it so that class has no connection to who, who experiences these. You got to make incarceration, all these other traumas, kind of just like a floating miasma that can strike black people at random with no concern for income. And, you know, think about the... so. It is really hard for me to imagine how anyone can like pitch any sort of socialism, any sort of working class movement when, you know, we don't want to acknowledge the class position of white folks and we don't want to acknowledge white folks at the bottom. And I think about these movies that dramatize black drama and there's always, you know, it's really the focus of all black people are affected by this equally, keeping up the idea that any of us can speak for any one of us and kind of cutting out any harm that's done to white folks at the bottom. So even if a movie doesn't come off as saying class doesn't matter at all, it's just like it's not a jumping off point for a socialist movement or a working class movement if you can't acknowledge the suffering of like white poor folks. But if I even mention that, I start hearing about how white poverty is not the same as black poverty. It's not, man. Uh, I've ever seen uh, Different Strokes. <laughs> oh my god yeah. it's uh it's different poverty man it's just different poverty philip drummond actually was a poor white person on that show he's, he's trying to show white poverty 
Yeah, I mean, just you know, just maybe just I'm going to take the L on this argument long term, and there's going to be something unique about having white skin and not enough money for food versus having black skin and not enough money for food. Maybe well, that's. I mean, I mean, ultimately, the purpose of this whole kind of bifurcation of poverty is to make it seem like, listen, because you know the Negroes have this special poverty, we have to give them special remedies that we know that white people will reject anyway, because we're not really trying to solve their problems anyway. We're not trying to solve poverty for anyone. What we're trying to do is manage the fact that the perception of poverty is racialized so we can do nothing about it. In other words, we keep the charade of actually trying to address the poverty going while we want to do nothing about poverty for anyone. So it's a convenient way to keep this whole kind of con game going over and over and over again. Someone says yeah. Bertram uh, is a happier, younger Pascal. I would add that Bertram is actually less happy than Pascal. <laughs> and actually Bertram is like the younger more fiery uh, soon to be curmudgeon I mean you know these all sound like great futures I mean even to put people <laughs> in the same category as Pascal on temporal line I gotta be doing something right so I'm happy about that oh wow I'm very honored that you would make such kind statements about me and my work Bertram because I, I you know I've always, I, I I see hope in the future when young people like you realize the con and cut right through it. Uh, Pascal, there's a question right now about the Kerner Commission report. Someone's asking about what was that report? And it's the Kerner Commission report. Can you talk a little bit about the Kerner Commission report? The Kerner Commission report was a report issued by Lyndon Johnson in the late 1960s, I believe in 1968. During the urban rebellions between 1967 and 1971, there were over 300 urban rebellions that plagued cities throughout America. And the Lyndon Baines Johnson administration was trying to ascertain what were the causes of the rebellions and what were the ways and the means that could be done to neutralize the capacity of them happening again? Because the United States was so concerned about these rebellions that they literally thought it was possible that it could be partially a Soviet conspired plot to have the Russians involved in having them actually take hold. And one of the means by which the Kerner Commission report suggested was to increase the presence of black people in popular culture, in media, in news, in television, and in, in, in comedies, in sitcoms, and plays, and all of these places to basically get black people to be more vested in seeing their images on the screen, as opposed to wanting to be politically motivated to challenge the state and burn down and burn down um, uh, edifices within their communities. Isn't this? some bastardized version bastardized version of the same you know dumbass deal of psychological wages being white poor but getting to be the same skin color as the president isn't that dandy for you like i feel all the time that i'm being convinced that i should be accepting the same psychological wages that the boys made fun of i mean he didn't make fun of he thought it really mattered i'm i'm denigrating but like i can't pay my rent with psychological wages i can't eat with it all i can do is have some strange feeling of being better and i feel like i'm always being pitched the same thing like you know you're on tv you're in the culture you're you know i, I don't i yeah it just it just feels like so thin i don't know how that's a, a useful deal for me to just be represented but not in a better situation economically well, that's the interesting conversation around like this difference between uh, different uh, ethnic groups and what poverty looks like. You know, in my travels around this wonderful rock we live on called Earth, I've never really looked better than the other. Um, I've actually spent too much time in areas because, you know, we forget most black people live in urban centers. So I've seen urban poverty from the California perspective, from the New York perspective, but I've also seen um, uh, poverty and poverty in the, in the hinterlands of the Virginias and kind of all, all through the Appalachians. Some of that shit was like, what the fuck? And then in parts of those people literally living next to uh, open trenches of sewage. You know, just on that, and this is for anyone, because this would go off into a tangent for sure, but for anyone listening who wants to dive into this deeper, so much of the argument that's been made over the last few years, and really, again, going back to like just the 2010s period, um, 
<laughs> I'm seeing some of these comments. Right? <laughs> no comment, Brown Center. No comment. <laughs> um, so much. Uh, see that question made me lose. So much of. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll say this is an audio. Got it, I got audio. It, I got it. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. Okay. Okay. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. So much of making white poverty different than black poverty all hinge on the word poorer. Almost every report you go back to, it hinges on poorer, not poor, not being in poverty, being poorer than some white person. I'll give an example. A big one that Coates covered a lot was the Jargowski research on um, being in concentrated poverty and that black folks were more likely A, to be in concentrated poverty, even when they weren't poor, and B, even when they weren't poor, to live in poorer neighborhoods. First thing to attack the poorer neighborhoods, they weren't poor. They were poorer than the white neighborhoods, but they still had a median income that was above the poverty level. It just wasn't at the same level as the white folks. But this was used as a way of saying, oh, see, all the black folks are living close together in the poor centers. The other thing had to do with concentrated poverty. This is one of those sleights of hands where, yes, if you took non-white or non-poor whites, 98% of them did not live in concentrated poor neighborhoods. The black percentage was higher in that 91 or 92% of non-poor black people didn't live in the ghetto either. But that percentage difference, if you don't give the numbers like I did, you can say, oh, black folks live in the ghetto despite income at rates that are three four or five times higher, but we're talking about single digit differences. And they did the same thing with neighborhoods. And this was all part of a push to make <laughs> this idea that white poverty was somehow loftier and better than black poverty. And it really hinges on this idea of being poorer than a white person being made equal to the federal poverty line and below. And that is not the definition of poverty. You know, it's really interesting because it, it, the, the last thing, because I'm looking at some of the comments in the chat, and it's incredible, just acknowledging that there could be white people that are poor gets some Negroes to get outraged. It's like, what are you talking about them? They've done everything. Why is there a them? Who, who is this them? Like, as this some kind of collective identity of it's all of them versus all of us. They are, they are, they are people of all individual backgrounds who suffer from all different types of social and economic ilks and plagues. So we're so stuck into this race relations nonsense that we think that oh, you're white, everything is great, you're fine, you're living in you know, you know, in, in you know, Hollywood, everything's awesome, you got no problems. You're black, oh, you must be in the hood, man. Everything is bad because we're so stuck into this mentality that of of total binaries that we can't possibly believe that individuals have different actual narratives in terms of where their life is. Something um, that has been frustrating to me, uh, hopefully it touches on the same point, Pascal, but there's, you know, uh, we have hundreds of years of existential philosophy written mostly by middle and upper class folks exploring all the ways that a life where you're not starving or in poverty or getting your head cracked in by a police officer can still be a wildly unfulfilling, soul-crushing, terrible <laughs> existence. And I never want to take away from anyone that there's no other ways that your life can be horrible. Poverty just seems to be this really contentious one because it seems to be the one resource that you need to claim to get white sympathy. And it's it dovetails to me with this. <clears throat> Americans are basically in our culture. We have to convey all suffering if we want to convey in public in economic terms. Unless mental health or philosophy reemerges until then, an American on average can't say I have suffered greatly, but they can say I've worked for everything I had. I didn't have a silver spoon. I've never been given anything freely. And just contemplate for a moment what a wretched existence you are claiming for yourself. If no family or friend has ever given you anything of economic value freely, but in order to express any existential angst with your life in the public square without being shamed, you have to shoehorn everything into a narrative about financial strain. So we all have to fight for whose financial strain led to the worst possible life. And it's in part because we just can't use mental health, can't use religion, can't talk about spiritual. And I'm not saying that these are frames that one's better than the other, but we're just, you want to talk about suffering the public square. It's got to be a story of financial strain. That's the only way you're allowed to complain about anything. 
I think it's hi Bertram, by the way. <laughs> Never been like formally introduced because some people are rude. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, I think Sorry. it's uh poverty you can claim. You can also claim uh having been in war. And mm. those two things people Fair you know, point. Yeah, they'll get out of your way for that. What do you say about war? Empty Sun, I didn't hear the last thing you sure. said. Sure. Um, people will give you a certain amount of respect if you've been in war. Anything to do with war, anything to do with military, even the cops, it's extended to them. Or poverty. That's how you I actually don't think people in America give you respect for poverty. I think they try to look at you as an outcast and they blame your problems on yourself. Only if you're rich can they give you credit for poverty. Yeah. Well, if you became rich. Yes. Mm. And there are people who, you know, like Trump, my dad gave me a million dollars. That's all I had to get started. Oh, you know what? A little loan. Yeah, no. Just a little loan. a tiny loan. The, this is a tiny loan. <laughs> <laughs> the, the concept of, and this is what I mean by having to fit everything into uh, an economic framework. Because all suffering has to happen within this context, that means that we have to treat being rich as this edenic existence like you're not rich until you have so much money that only acts of like god cosmic mischief can like befall you if anything else can reach you you can claim i'm not rich yet and that's because none of us want to say oh i've reached the point where i can never complain about anything that happens to me i'm rich there you know we really look at like admitting that you're rich or that you're that well off as basically saying you can't have suffering of any kind anymore. We treat it as if it's, it's, it's just, it's, yeah, ridiculous. No, that, that's actually good to have so much money. Like we love watching these, uh, these sports documentaries where you see these millionaire athletes lose all their money, you know, with a, a couple bad years of a drug problem. But there's like so many gajillionaires that just, they're like, dude, I still do drugs. Like they don't give a damn. You think David Bowie was clean? <laughs> <laughs> Are you saying he wasn't? It's I'm just saying <laughs> that uh, you get to a certain level, you get a nurse in the room when you're partying. I, I, I'm wondering, because I know, Pascal, you've been involved in this. I'm sure you all have been involved in this in a while. And uh, is there, what what do you think is the proper use of something like the racial wealth gap? You, and maybe it could have multiple, but is there one, like, is there a place where it made sense to, like, utilize this? Because um, I, mean, I, I have the instinct that the, it is, but I have an issue with the way most people are going to interpret it. I think that the problem, I think that when making barometers of black economic condition and comparing the conditions of black people to other ethnic groups, the argument being said to demonstrate, particularly in the face of the subprime mortgage crisis, how black people were particularly affected, it was wise to show where their position was that was part of the legitimation for why you use racial wealth gap discourse. However, I believe that because it came about during a period where there was a cry for public goods governance, it was leaned into as a means to try to extract racial democracy or race first politics in a period of time that had demonstrated that for 50 years of race first politics, which is what we've had for 50 years, what we've gotten is an increase in the class this differentiation between black elites and black poor. So I think it was a product of a of a misappropriation of energy on a problem that was caused by the subprime mortgage crisis that became a point of focus because let's make this clear the black elites like Darity or or the people who were or people who are college proximate who are founding these reparations movements are being subsidized by foundations by think tanks that are capitalized. And the reason they're capitalized to promote this type of thinking is because they know it does not challenge the status quo because it allows the state and capital to dole out 
a racial democracy form of remedy for black people that is going to be class skewed in a way that does not really solve the means of problems for the majority of black people, because that's what we've been doing for the last 50 years anyway. So it's just a, a retreading of the, the whole hamster wheel over and over again. And the ruling class knows this. The people who control the means of production know, knows this. The foundations that finance this stuff knows this, and they're aware of it. And we're stuck in this cycle because socialist voices or dialectical materialist voices who are seeing this con will not be given the actual thoroughfare in media to make the analysis cogent that this is a hustle. It's a hustle that's being paid for with deep pockets and people are being subsidized to push it because the last thing they want is a solidaristic class-wide foundation of an economic program to challenge the way poverty is affecting people across the board. And whenever you hear people say things like, oh, class or remedy don't work, well, we haven't had class remedy in 50 years for black people. How well has that worked? We literally have not had any class politics since the great society. And what it has done is literally increase the gap between poor and working class black people and black elites. Yeah. You know, I, I, I really wouldn't be able to understand anyone who suggested that we've been trying all these class-based policies to um, improve things for black folks, because outside of like, you know, your, uh, your suite of what remains of welfare programs, when you expand it to other things, like go to college, go to Pell Grants, go to any of these um, other initiatives, they ha they really don't care about class. Class isn't written into it. For example, you know, uh, very often the Pell Grant is considered a handout in a way to poor black folks. When you look at the actual numbers coming out of uh, the Pell Institute report or NCES, it's majority middle class folks who are getting the benefits of the Pell because it's not strongly, uh, it, it has no real class inflection. M most of these policies that I see that come out, it's always, yeah, in theory, somebody who's working class, you know, bottom of working class, um, poor could benefit, but no extra effort is spent on it. And the only way people seem to be able to get these things passed, and I don't know if, if this is really true, maybe they're not trying other ways, it doesn't seem like they are, is if whatever's supposed to help the black poor will have a large uh, amount of resources that can go to black middle and upper class who ultimately get more effective at using the policy, like the Pell Grant, for example, than the black poor ever were. Um, so I, I just wouldn't understand how anyone could say we've had all these policies or things like it, it doesn't feel like it's ever really been tried, or at least I'm just not seeing a ton of policies that are like, you know what, it's the black poor who are really well off. They're the ones who are uh, receiving the lopsided shitty end of this distribution of incarceration, unemployment, concentrated poverty. So the policy we're going to come up with is going to be really targeted on them and because we're thinking about, you know, the real daily life of being black and poor and the, you know, problems you're going to have getting to buildings, filling out forms, doing all this other stuff. We're going to add additional resources to simplifying that or helping you along the way or making sure that in addition to the Pell Grant, you're going to have a guidance counselor who helps you work through financial aid forms because I've actually looked up on Amazon and there is no FAFSA like how to for poor folks. So it's just every time I see any of these initiatives outside of, you know, historical welfare, I'm not seeing anything that has like a real class awareness that's for black folks. Well, on that note, <laughs> we will be heading into the bonus patron champagne room after hours. Bertram, you'll be joining us for the bonus patron champagne room after hours. Oh, you know, I've got no life, man. I just sit around reading stats, and being glad anytime someone who's like <laughs> a second generation academic deigns to speak to me. Well, we this the new you haven't been haven't seen this yet, but now in the bonus champagne room, the patron paywall. It's a call in segment, so we'll be we'll be having people call in. Definitely, uh, you've been a hit on this show, so I'm sure as people want to call in and ask you questions, they want to know is that hair natural? Uh, are the tips dyed? Don't answer it yet. Oh, wait for behind the paywall. They want to know what Pascal is wearing for the New York show. We told you. Thanks, for the, thanks for the invite to New York. Oh, sorry. Did you want to invite to New York? I Not told now. you some people are rude. Some people. Not now. Oh, here we go. M2 sound with the whole blah, 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 blah. blah, blah, blah. 
The hat is nice, but rudeness is unattractive. Oh, for real. I know. You guys are you guys are mean. Someone, Carla Hernandez, is asking: Does Bertrand like carne asada or chicken? I feel like these are loaded. Like I'm not hip to whatever. This feels like that, like elementary school or I high school question. question. I think it's a date night question oh. by Carla Hernandez. Well, the what kind of uh, taco you prefer? That didn't sound right at all. But you know, <laughs> hey. you know, we're we walk, walk away from this horrible taco joke that I didn't even try to make. I they literally made that. Yes, but before we go. Uh, I made an intro video for today. I was not going to do one uh, because I have walked away from the video essay, but I can't walk away from the intro video. This is the only way I could think to put uh, a few of my favorite black people in one video clip. Rick James uh, and uh, Arnold Drummond, a.k.a. Gary Coleman from Different Strokes, and also uh, Jamal Khashoggi's Pop is in this there's a lot of interesting folks in this clip so thank you guys uh, uh, and we're gonna go out with has an indoor pool and jacuzzi and there's horses in the tennis court. And my mom was there, you know, she's getting older and it's nice just to be around her, you know. I'm trying to buy the neighborhood up, but it's a really nice area. It's out, it's about oh, 25 minutes, 30 minutes from Buffalo. It's in the country and it's a sanctuary for me. It really keeps, it gives me a good balance on life, you know. It's, um, it's a real nice place to be, to know that your roots are right next to you and whatever you need them for strength, you go there. I have a family of eight. Four boys, four girls. The very deep heart throb of the ghetto. In the age of diversity and inclusion, the United States celebrated its first Juneteenth as a national holiday. With all of the advancements of black Americans since the civil rights movements of the 60s, there is still much discussion around the racial wealth gap. Is this a conversation that is actually beneficial for poor and working class black Americans? Or is this a bourgeois project rooted in helping only a small section of black elites? Is there value in these race first policies? We'll ask these questions and more. This is Revolution. Does that mean I can say, welcome a boy, son? Yeah. <laughs> that was too much. <laughs> yeah, that was a lot. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys for hanging out with us. We'll see you in the champagne room. Uh, Patreon.com slash Bitter Lake presents. You guys got like 10 minutes to get there now. We are out. <laughs> <laughs>